Hi, everyone. Welcome. Happy Thursday. I think it's Thursday. Um, I hope that you are excited about what is about to be presented. I know it's a little bit strange to be um, talking about a webinar in which we talk about the classroom because we're not really in the classroom, but on behalf of the Language Learning for Children's SIG, we're excited to present or welcome um, Andrea, Dory, and Sarah. So thank you. Thank you, Marissa. Um, hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us tonight for our webinar on enacting social justice in early language classrooms through critical cultural awareness. So we're really excited to have this chance to share with you something that's um, so important to us. Um, we'd also like to thank ACTFL and the Learning Languages for Children's SIG for sponsoring this webinar. We're really excited to be here. Um, before we get started, I wanted to just take a moment to um, introduce ourselves. Um, and you can meet the team even though you can't really see us. Um, I'm Dory Conlon Perugini, and tonight joining me are Andrea Amato and Sarah Lindstrom. We have the pleasure of teaching together in Glastonbury, Connecticut. Andrea Amato teaches both elementary and high school Spanish. And in addition, she's also um, pursuing her doctorate in educational leadership from Central Connecticut State University. Sarah Lindstrom currently teaches Spanish at the high school level, but she's also taught at the elementary level as well. So she is experienced with the um, early grades um, also. Um, she's also our head teacher in Glastonbury, and she received her doctorate from Central Connecticut State University in educational leadership. As I mentioned, I'm Dory Conlon Perugini, and I teach elementary Spanish, and I'm also currently pursuing my doctorate in applied linguistics and discourse studies um, at the University of Connecticut. All right, so now that the introductions are out of the way, let's get started. Um, we have some learning targets for you today. So our learning targets are, first, I can identify the components of intercultural competence and social justice. I can recognize some principles of practice for intercultural competence and social justice. I can use examples from other classrooms to consider applications in my own classroom and I can reflect on my own growth in intercultural competence as well as social justice awareness. So as you can see, the first half of the presentation is going to focus mainly on the theoretical aspects, which we know can get a little heavy, but we think it's really important. The, the theory is essential to this whole presentation so that um, later after the webinar is over, you can create your own lessons. Um, and then the second half will be more practical applications for the early language classroom, keeping in mind our students often have novice language proficiency and their cognitive levels. We keep all that in mind when we're planning our lessons. Um, and then we wanna show you, um, we wanna connect those examples from our classrooms back to the theory. So with that, I'm gonna pass the mic along to Sarah, who's gonna start us off with some theory of intercultural competence. Hi everyone, and thank you, Dory, for the introduction. I'm so happy to be here today to talk to you all about this topic, one that we are really passionate about. Um, so the focus of my research over the years has been intercultural competence. So I'm just gonna briefly go over the theory and principles of practice that are part of classrooms that, well, language classrooms specifically, that aim to promote ICC in an effort to connect that theory and the practice to the teaching for social justice. So as you see, we are looking at Byram's model and in his model, um, well, his model is actually quite prevalent in, in our community of language educators. It's, he's had work um, published by ACTFL. And in his model, we see that there's the five savoir, knowledge, attitudes, two different skill sets, and then in the center, what he calls education. Um, and in the image, you see that education is the center, and that's really important because the attitudes, knowledge, and skills really enable the person or the student um, to have this education as in, as in political education or as what he refers to critical cultural awareness, which is also the term you saw in the title of this presentation. So I just want to demonstrate here that, here again, you see the savoir, I want to demonstrate that it is the development of the knowledge, attitudes, and skills that bring about the education or the critical cultural awareness. And it's part of our job as educators to get our students there. So starting with knowledge, um, we see that, you know, and we know that when we're teaching cultures, knowledge, social groups, and exploration of products, practices, and perspectives um, is really important. And I think it's also really helpful to see that Byram's model of ICC overlaps nicely with this concept and with the actual world readiness standards. 
Um, when we look at the skills domains, we see the two separate sets of skills, um, interpreting and relating, and then discovery and interaction. And if we continue with that connection to the actual standards, we can actually see that we're talking about connections, comparisons, and community standards within the development of these skills. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like in practice in a moment. Um, in case you're counting, I did not mention the communication C, um, and that's because that's the vehicle through which we teach and assess most content, so it's there implicitly. Um, and getting to the attitudes part, um, the attitudes is probably the most difficult element of the model to teach, um, but it's perhaps one of the most important. Uh, I found it to be something that is really difficult to assess, so I spent a lot of time reflecting on that, and I'll also show a little bit later in the presentation some work you can use to um, reflect with your classes. Um, but all of that's to say that the development of these knowledge, attitudes, and skills are what Byram says leads to critical cultural awareness, and that's defined as the, evaluate to, um, the ability to evaluate knowledge of social groups both critically and on the basis of explicit criteria. And I know it sounds profound, but, and that's because it is, but I think you'll see in the examples that Dory and Andrea provide that this is possible with novice language learners and even when they're very young. So um, I just want to finish up the discussion of theory of ICC um, with, um, with how I think it connects to social justice, and Dory will explain more about this in a bit. Um, and I, I also want to say that I, I think um, the idea that we are aiming for creating intercultural citizens as language teachers is really, really heartening. Um, to think that you know we're sending our students out into the world with critical cultural awareness is a, is a really meaningful thing. Um, but this here, I wanted to show you the elements of ICC that to me are, are the crux of what it means to be an intercultural citizen. Um, we're teaching our students to look outside of their own country. Um, we're teaching them to focus on the here and now and to take action, ideally, in their community and beyond. Um, and we're also fostering an interest in human rights, where we see that encouraging humanistic thought and action, um, students really are working for social justice. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I do want to share with you some principles of practice. So hopefully you can take something useful away from, from this section um, of the presentation. And it's um, well, first, I want to just point out that the 2017 Successful Act for Can Do Statements, the intercultural version, has these uh, principles of practice within them. So you see there's the investigate and the interact for benchmark for the, what they have them for all proficiency levels. And um, those are definitely very helpful principles of practice when you're looking, and this, this tool is actually very helpful for you to see concretely what that looks like. Um, and then they also have a reflection tool. Now that's a separate piece that you would click on if you're on the website for the can do statements. That's also very, very important and helpful. And it actually, the reflection tool offers you the option to reflect in English. And I know especially for novice or younger learners, that might be something you should look into. Um, but these three elements, investigating, interacting, and reflecting are a really great place to start. Um, and then I have additional three um, components or principles of practice that I found to be key in my own research, and um, those elements are, are, are they appear in good practices in any context, not just in language learning. Um, those are connecting the material to the students, connecting students with the content, um, modeling behaviors, especially when we talk about those attitudes, which are so difficult to teach, and a big one is using essential questions to guide learning. And I think you'll see from what Dory and Andrea share that these elements come together quite well and have positive outcomes. Um, and now I'll, I'll let Andrea discuss the theory and practice of social justice in education. Great, thank you, Sarah. Um, so I'm gonna take a few minutes just to quickly touch base on the theory of social justice um, and how this translates into critical social justice. Um, so most people have a working definition of social justice. Um, it is commonly understood as principles of equality and fairness for all people and respect for their basic human rights. Um, most, um, I would say, um, say and convey that they value these principles. However, uh, very seldomly um, are important questions discussed um, or even agreed upon uh, when we're talking and thinking about social justice. So to begin with, how we define social justice and how we come to understanding can definitely be a challenge. Um, secondly, um, 
Another challenge kind of comes to the surface when we consider what it means to practice social justice. Um, generally speaking, because people see themselves as valuing social justice, they also automatically see themselves as acting justly. Um, in response to questions about how people practice social justice, many say that they treat everyone the same the same way without regard to difference because and because they do this, um, they assume that their actions are aligned with what they value. Um, so these challenges definitely make it difficult to truly grasp um, and understand what is meant by social justice, which in turn makes implementing a social justice framework in the classroom um, more of a feat. Um, so in moving away from social justice and adopting the term critical social justice, um, we begin to distinguish this concept from mainstream standpoints. Um, so a critical social justice um, so a, a critical approach to social justice refers to um, specific theoretical perspectives um, that recognize that society uh, is stratified um, in significant and pervasive ways um, along social group lines um, that include ability, sexuality, gender, race, and class. Um, critical social justice always always recognizes inequality as something that is deeply embedded um, in the fabric of society um, and seeks to change this. Um, so obviously to implement and to advocate for critical social justice, we do need um, social justice educators um, to guide students along um, three um, important fronts. Uh, first, social justice educators guide students in critical analysis of how mainstream knowledge is presented, often presented as neutral, objective, and universal. So the goal here is to um, uncover how information reflects a particular, mostly dominant perspective. Um, social justice educators in doing this also guide students in understanding how knowledge is socially constructed um, and bound by the social context uh, that produced it in the first place. Um, second, social justice educators guide students in critical self-reflection um, of their own socialization. So oftentimes educators ask students to evaluate and reflect on how their positions inform their actions. Um, and finally, uh, social justice educators guide students in developing the skills um, with which to analyze and challenge relations of privilege and oppression. So in guiding students through these three, um, three different fronts, um, social justice educators aim to develop specific skills, um, the ability to think critically, uh, grapple with multiple perspectives, as well as engage constructively with alternative perspectives, um, the ability to raise critical questions, engage with research, uh, recognize power relations, um, as well as valuing collaboration over competition and tolerating ambiguity. Um, without these skills, um, students are ill-equipped to cultivate um, a just and democratic society. Um, and so in the next slide, we look to the Teach for Tolerance social justice standards, uh, much like Sarah showed with ICC, to guide our practice and as we begin to implement a social justice framework in the classroom. Um, so later we will give you some examples of um, to show you how this sort of all comes together and comes about. Um, and now um, Dory is going to tie all these pieces together and um, talk about how ICC and social justice work together. Great, thank you, Andrea and Sarah, for walking us through some ICC and social justice. Um, so now that we know a little bit more about the theory for ICC and social justice, I wanna talk about how they work together. Um, but first, I don't want anyone to view these as like two more and separate things that you have to add to your plate. Um, the way I try to view it just for myself is that ICC and social justice work together to create this kind of like lens through which I can plan my curriculum and make choices about my teaching. So you're going to see that critical reflection is really important not only for our students, but really for the teacher as well. 
So I use these um, frameworks to really reflect on my teaching and to make choices about how I'm going to implement things in the classroom. So when thinking about the overlap between ICC and social justice, we can see it strongly in these different areas. So for example, um, students learn to reflect on their own identities in both of the different frameworks. They learn to communicate with and mediate between people from different linguistic and cultural backgrounds. They evaluate events in their own and other cultures based on specific criteria. They address societal problems in collaboration with people from other backgrounds, and they become more aware of inequities within their own community and work to build a more equitable society. Um, we can also see ICC and social justice working together in an area called intercultural citizenship. So intercultural citizenship is when students use all of those attitudes, knowledge, and skills that Sarah talked about from Byram's model of ICC. So they use those attitudes, knowledge, and skills, and they apply it to a problem in the here and now. And when they do that, they're really engaging in social justice. Um, so in intercultural citizenship, there's a concern about social justice and a belief in the humanistic thought and, and values of humanistic thought and action. Um, there's a readiness to encourage a questioning attitude, which I love. I feel like a lot of our early um, language learners have that kind of questioning attitude already. Um, and then there's a willingness to promote social action in the world. Um, and if you want to read more about this, I definitely recommend that you check out Wagner Cardetti and Byram's new book, which was recently published by Actful. Um, you can read about it more in depth. I, I definitely highly recommend it. So now that we've talked a little bit more about theory, we wanted to give you some practical examples from the classroom so you can kind of see how this all ties together. Um, so first I wanna bring an example from my classroom. I call it, it's who I am. And um, this example is about exploring our identity through our names. So just a little bit of context about um, our program. So in Glastonbury, students start studying Spanish in first grade for 25 minutes, two times a week. And then in second grade, that increases to 25 minutes, three days a week, and it continues that way all the way through fifth grade. So the lesson and the unit you're about to see is from my third grade classroom. And um, so they, these students are in their third year of studying Spanish. Um, and I'm gonna start with our unit goals. So in Glastonbury, we have um, essential questions that guide all of our different grade levels. So our third grade essential question is, who am I as part of our global community? So that's like an overarching essential question that guides us throughout the year. So one of our district goals for third grade is that students can identify the continents on a world map, which is a pretty like solid goal for third grade. Um, or maybe even younger. But I really don't enjoy teaching that unit because I feel like it just becomes like this memory recall unit and it's kind of boring for me and it's kind of boring for my students. So I was really reflecting on how can I make this more engaging for my students and how can I um, include some of these aspects of social justice and intercultural competence. So I started with a linguistic goal. I said, okay, just speaking of language, how can I introduce myself you know, I can introduce myself and I can tell someone where I'm from. That's a pretty basic thing that students learn how to do in language classrooms. But then I looked at the teaching tolerance standards and I included an identity goal. I know and like who I am and can talk about my family and myself. And then I also added a diversity goal. I know I want to know about other people and how our lives and experiences are both similar and different. And I actually give these um, goals, all three of those goals, the linguistic identity and diversity goals to my students in English. So they know why we're doing the things that we're doing. So I display them in English, but then I always refer to them and talk about them in Spanish. So once I had these goals, I started planning my lesson. And I started with um, this concept of that our names tell a story of who we are. So I created a homework assignment. I rarely give my students homework. And when I do, it's usually a reflection activity. So I started with this reflection activity that they could do at home in English. And it was just a couple basic questions. First, they had to choose one of their names, um, either their first name, their middle name, or their last name, or even a nickname. Once they chose their name, they had to find out what continent that name that what continent that name originated on. And then they had to tell me one thing that they like about their name. And then optionally, they could tell me something interesting about their name. So some students said, like, I was named after my grandmother. Another student I found out, um, her name is actually the name of a holy book from her religion, which I didn't know. 
Um, and really when I, I got this information back, it was more for me to be able to connect with the students and to kind of see where they were at. They didn't present these things to the classroom um, in Spanish at any point in time, though they did present a little bit of it, as you'll see. While I was waiting for these um, activities to come back, um, their homework to come back. We did some classroom activities. So first we started just by locating continents on a map and kind of talking about them. Then we moved on to some interpreting of authentic resources. So for example, we compared lists of top 10 names, um, actually top 100 names in different countries, and students made observations about names that they found were surprising about U.S. and, you know, sometimes there were similarities between U.S. names and um, the names in the list of L2 cultures. Um, we also read this book that Andrea actually introduced me to called Alma, I'll read it, um, Alma and how she um, got her name. It's a really great book and very comprehensible for early language classrooms. Um, and then we did an interpersonal activity where students had to introduce themselves to each other and tell, um, tell each other where they were from. And it was interesting because I thought that was a simple activity, but the students really thought about it critically. And they said, well, Profe, when I say where I'm from, do I say where I was born, where I grew up, where I live now? So they were starting to, um, they had to develop this tolerance for ambiguity, and they had to decide for themselves how they wanted to represent um, themselves when the person asked that question. When their homework finally did come back, we did a little activity where I had the students write their names on an hola me llamo, like hello my name is sticker. Um, you can see that my students use just their regular English names, I don't assign Spanish names, and these were names that they chose. So for some of them, their nicknames or last names. And then they, we, we use strings to connect them to the different continents. From there, in Spanish, I would ask um, just simple questions like which continent has the most names, which continent has the fewest names, um, how many names come from Africa, how many names come from South America. And then from there, I started to ask them more critical questions like why do you think that there are fewer names from South America than from Asia, for example. And generally when they were answering those questions, they did at answer them in English, whereas the other questions they could answer in Spanish. But I was okay with that because they were very brief answers. Um, and one of the things that the student um, I asked is I said, how come there are so many names from Europe when most of us weren't born in Europe? And one student said in English, she goes, well, I think it's because we live in New England and our names come from old England. So that actually opened up this like brief conversation about colonization and what effects it has when people move from other countries um, and colonize other countries, what is um, lost in that process as well. Um, and a lot of students reported that they, um, they learned a lot about themselves through this process and some of them didn't know they were named after family friends, for example. So it was really interesting for them to see. So after that was done, I went back to our unit goals and I asked our students if they felt they met them. And they did feel that they met the linguistic goal, but they said they felt so, so about our social justice goals, our identity and diversity goal. So I went back and I said, all right, what else can we do for this? Um, so I love this poem by George L. Lyon. It's really beautiful. A lot of people are familiar with it called Where I'm From. Um, so I'm from clothespins, I'm from Clorox and carbon tetrachloride. I'm from dirt under the back porch, black glistening, it tasted like beets. Um, and I've seen people do this in their language classrooms, but I was always like, all right, my early language kids like cannot do this. And then somebody I follow on Twitter, um, she goes by the woke Spanish teacher on Twitter. Um, if you don't know her, you should definitely follow her. She posted how she did this activity with her early language students. And that really gave me the courage I needed to try it with mine. So I created a template where students could use um, language that they've already acquired in grades one, two, and three to create their own poem. And I also was talking to a critical friend of mine, um, Manuela Wagner, who I mentioned before, and she had this great idea of adding another line to it. I am from, but also. So that way students weren't creating kind of stereotypes about themselves or about their communities. So here's, I'm not going to read the whole thing, um, but here's a poem that one of my students um, wrote that I have permission to share called I Am From. I am from Glastonbury, but I'm also from Ghana, Africa. I'm from the Glastonbury River, but also from the mountains of Ghana. I'm from the library in Glastonbury, but also from my school in Ghana. Um, I'm from banana from Glastonbury, but also rice ball with peanut soup from Ghana. So this student was really able to show that his identity was not just one thing, but he has multiple identities. He has multiple things that make up his identity. Students who are not from another country, um, 
they often talked about contradictions within their own community. So they said, for example, I'm from Glastonbury where there's apple orchards, but also McDonald's. Um, so I really liked that idea of um, adding that piece to that. And I'm glad that I had a critical friend who could kind of walk me through that. So when you're doing your lessons, it's always great to have a critical friend who can kind of look at that for you. So before I actually had the students do their um, poems, um, I wanted to try to build some community through input. So we know that they can't do the output until they have the input. So we have several Spanish speaking adults in our building from secretaries to our security officer to um, a fourth grade teacher is a Spanish speaker. So I had them write their own poems to serve as models for the students, but also because a lot of our students are heritage and native speakers and they didn't even know they had these other adults in the building that spoke Spanish. So this was like a community building event for them. Um, and it also led into a very happenstance way for the students to evaluate their own culture. So somebody I know, again, through Twitter, um, he's local to Hartford and he named his daughter a name that had an accent mark in it. And when the daughter's birth certificate came back, it didn't have it in there. So through that process, he found out that in Connecticut, we have a law where we're not allowed to put any marks, accent marks or tildes or anything um, on any official documents. So I asked the students, what do you think about this? And then I partnered with the classroom teachers and I said, hey, I have this prompt for my students um, to, to kind of think about this um, law that we have. Could they write about it during their language arts time? And the classroom teachers agreed that they could. Um, and the students were kind of like iffy. They were like, well, you know, I understand, you know, why we have this law and that the computer systems can't handle it. Um, and other students said, well, no, that law is not fair and I don't agree with it. So it's really interesting to see their feedback, especially since it was so mixed. So then we, um, I remembered we have another um, person in our building who speaks Spanish and his last name is Peña, so Mr. Peña. And um, for those of you who don't speak Spanish, a Peña is like a large rock. So here we see the Peña de Bernal from Mexico. Um, and that last name is like, if you think about a rock, it's very strong and powerful. Um, but without the Enye, his name changes from Mr. Peña to Mr. Pena. And in those of you who speak Spanish know that pena is not a very strong image. It's an image of shame and embarrassment. So his name goes from something really powerful to something that is almost shameful. So I went back and I showed that example to my students. I said, well, what do you think about this now? And we talked about it in Spanish. I showed a lot of visuals and um, this is somebody they know in real life. Um, then they went back and reflected again. And when they reflected a second time, they really felt passionately that this law was unfair and they wanted to do something to fix it. Majority of the students thought that way. So I gave those students the opportunity if they wanted to, they could participate in an extension activity um, where we could brainstorm ways that we could actually maybe start to change the law. So one idea they had together, we came up with um, the concept of a hashtag, mi nombre no es pena, my name is not shame. Um, and they said that we could use this hashtag to kind of bring awareness to this, um, I, this issue that we have in our society. Um, and then from there, um, I approached the classroom teachers again and I said, you know, this isn't something they can do in Spanish. Um, but the classroom teachers told me that in their regular classroom, they were learning how to write opinion pieces. So we know that's something common for early language students to, to learn how to form an opinion and then support it with facts. So, um, Again, they, they gave the um, students a prompt to write their opinion about this piece. And they wrote why they thought it was fair or unfair, and then the reasons supporting that. Um, and they were able to create this really beautiful piece in their L1 as part of their development of their regular language arts curriculum. So what I wasn't able to do in my language classroom because of their limits of um, language proficiency, they were able to do with their classroom teachers. Um, so I definitely encourage you to, um, to collaborate with your classroom teachers when possible. Um, I should also say that um, in this campaign, they also started to petition um, state legislators and we collaborated with the guy in the beginning of the story who I told you um, brought this to my awareness with his daughter. Um, he's actually a lawyer and um, we uh, started to collaborate with him to petition the legislators to change the law and also to um, collaborate with some other high school, um, high school Spanish classes. Um, and ELL classes to see if we can change this law. Unfortunately, that all got derailed because that all <laughs> happened right before um, we went, uh, for, went home for COVID and then never went back. Um, but we do hope to get that started again in the fall. 
Um, so that's how students were able to evaluate something from their culture and then go forward with it. So going back to that theory we talked about in the beginning um, and how ICC and social justice work together, we can see in this um, example from my classroom um, one way that students were able to reflect on their own identities. Um, they didn't necessarily mediate between people from different linguistic backgrounds, but they certainly did have to communicate with them when we collaborated with this other high school Spanish classes. Um, students did evaluate their own culture based on a specific criteria of fairness. They were just beginning to address societal problems in collaboration with a lawyer and in collaboration with those other classrooms. And they certainly did become aware of inequities within their own community and they attempted to work together to build a more equitable society. Um, so with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Andrea who's going to share an example from her classroom. Okay, thank you, Dory. Uh, I'm now going to go over one of our units for fourth grade. Um, part of this curriculum is to teach students about different kinds of sports, um, as well as introducing them to language functions that allow them to express and communicate their sports preferences, as well as um, other leisure activities. Um, so students also learn to explain why they prefer certain sports over others. So we can teach them different, so we teach them different adjectives and other language structures that allow them to express this. Um, so this is my second year teaching the fourth grade curriculum. And when I first began, I started to think of ways in which I could reframe and restructure this content in order to allow my students um, meaningful learning opportunities that would guide them to critically analyze gender stereotypes as they learned um, the linguistic component that also goes along with this unit. So um, you can see the essential question and the corresponding linguistic goal for this unit here. Um, as an extension, I used the teaching tolerance social justice standards to further develop this unit um, and used these goals to structure my lesson planning and instructional practices. So although my aim was still to get my students to explain why they prefer certain sports over um, over others in order to meet the linguistic goal. My objective was bigger than that, um, as can be conveyed in the identity, diversity, and action goals that you can see here. Um, so to begin to show you how I went about developing this unit, I will start by giving you some examples first of some of the interpretive activities that my students engaged in. Um, I like to start a unit, a unit by exposing my kids to a variety of authentic resources and then give them, um, and then with that, give them the input that they need to not only gather and make sense of the language and the language functions and structures, but also begin to interact with meaningful content that will challenge them to view things from a different perspective. Um, so for example, with this infographic, um, students analyzed the data across years for female versus male athletes at different Olympic Games. Um, although they were not able to interpret every minute detail of the resource, I made sure to strategically plan questions and activities with visual aids and sentence structures um, that would direct my students to look at specific components of this visual. Um, so from this one resource I was able to create and do a variety of different activities with my students and so I think that also speaks to the importance of finding quality authentic resources that allow teachers multiple opportunities to engage their students. Um, following the interpretation of this infographic I asked my students to reflect in their journals in L1. Um, unfortunately, I was not able to gather my students' journals before um, leaving, um, and I regret not being able to actually show you the reflections, but some of them made really interesting comments about the number of women athletes that participated in the Olympics. Um, some students pointed out that perhaps uh, this number increased due to women's roles changing throughout the years, um, and others Others even pointed out that maybe more women started to compete because they saw other women doing so, and consequently this inspired them to take part in the Olympics as well. Um, another point that students made when looking at the bar graph at the bottom of this infographic um, was that it seemed as though more males participated in more, quote, uh, more violent sports 
like boxing and wrestling. Um, and this was something that I was able to further extend when I exposed them to other resources such as this video um, that I have showing up in the next slide. Um, so like this, vi so I like this video for two reasons. First, um, it shows a sport that most people wouldn't really even consider a sport. Um, so I was able to communicate to students that it's important to be inclusive and accept different activities, not just those that tend to be more popular for some. Um, then, um, as you can see in this video, um, some of the images that it's showing, um, it challenges what most students would deem um, appropriate or normal gendered sports preferences. Um, so uh, as students began to make sense of all of this different content, um, I plan to have them engage um, in research, in a bit of research of sorts, uh, where they chose to, um, and we can move on to the next slide because I think this is a little bit, going a little bit longer than I expected. Um, so. I asked my students to engage in um, some research, a research activity where they chose to investigate one sport um, and gather their classmates' views and preferences on that sport. Um, so by then, they had already mastered the linguistic components that they needed to do these interviews in the target language. Um, so with that, um, students had two questions to research. First, um, as you can see in this graph here, I'll explain it if, you don't, um, if you're not a Spanish teacher um, or a Spanish speaker. Um, first, they had um, to get their classmates' uh, disposition and attitudes on a sport, whatever sport they each chose to research. And second um, was to get their classmates' opinions about that sport, as that, this next slide will show. Um, so students use their iPads um, and the Numbers app on their iPads to ask and answer each other questions. Um, and as they would ask and answer questions, they would input the data into the table, which was immediately generated into a bar graph. Um, so after students finished gathering their data, we took some time in class to share our graphs and evaluate the data. Um, I asked them to look for any patterns um, that were obvious to them. Um, and most of the conclusions that students made pointed out the obvious. Um, for sports such as dance and cheerleading, almost every boy expressed their dislike of that sport. Um, and they thought that the sports were boring. Um, in contrast, the majority of girls responded positively about sports like cheerleading and gymnastics. Um, and so uh, following that activity, I asked students to reflect on their findings. Um, and why they thought there was this discrepancy. Um, students talked about how they got into the sports that they did because they saw their older siblings doing these sports or their friends doing these sports and just followed what they saw others around them doing. Um, so as a class, we took some time to talk a little bit about this and I did do a reflection activity and an extension in um, L1 in their journals. Um, so like Dory, I collaborated with classroom teachers in order to take some time um, during their regular day to think about um, these reflection prompts and really um, and answer them based on the activities that they had just engaged in. Um, so a lot of um, a lot of students in 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 the reflections pointed out um, that they were able to gather that there are obviously some sports that were more popular for boys and there's some that are more popular for girls. And um, so once we started to see how this discrepancy in sports preferences, uh, we decided. Um, to advocate and advertise for different sports. Um, so students partner up and work together to create posters um, advertising different sports 
um, and showcasing these sports as being inclusive to all, not just boys, not just girls, but um, uh, sports as being something that everybody can partake in. Um, so students use a lot of the uh, language functions and structures that they have learned throughout this unit to put sentences together, um, to, to um, say and explain what they, what they thought about this sport, um, and making these posters that we were able to hang around the school. Um, so they really loved being able to see their work and effort and dedication come to life. Uh, and they really love being able to walk through the hallways of their school and see their posters advertising something that they believed was important for them. Um, so this was, um, and I didn't mention this before, but I think it's obvious, I'll just say it um, just because it's here, but this was in terms of the most of communication, how I was able to get my students to express what they know uh, within this um, social justice context. Um, in the target language, almost as a culmination of everything that they had learned beyond just the linguistic and language functions that I was, um, I, I had to teach as part of this unit. Um, so with this, um, Sarah is going to walk us um, to the next part. Oh, sorry, I should point out. Um, before we move on to Sarah, um, just quickly kind of, although I did mention some of these things, but I, I think it's obvious as I walked you through this unit, um, how you can see these principles of social justice and ICC um, surface in the different activities that students were able to do and engage in. Um, in terms of uh, mediating between people from different cultural backgrounds, um, you know, gender as, um, a cultural identity is something that they were able to really grapple with. Um, they were able to also evaluate events in, in terms of sports, um, um, in, in different sports that boys versus girls take part in um, based on specific criteria. They identified that this was a problem, um, that there are sports um, that are most popular to girls um, and uh, there are very negative dispositions about different sports um, and very negative attitudes about different sports. Uh, and so with um, uncovering this information and trying to dismantle this, um, this negative idea around different sports, students started to become aware uh, of the inequities and the gender inequities um, in their own communities, in their own classrooms. Um, and so, um, having them take charge and take action and put something together um, as a conclusion of this unit was very meaningful for them. Um, and it really uh, brought the learning to life. Um, so with this, I hope that you're able to see kind of how uh, both Dory and I's example um, really showcase how um, ICC and social justice can be done um, in um, the world language classroom. Okay, everyone, as we come to the end of our presentation, we wanted to share with you this quote from a book Dory has already recommended to you by Wagner, Cardetti, and Byram from their 2019 publication through ACTFL, Teaching Intercultural Citizenship Across the Curriculum. Um, and you'll see the full reference to this on our reference page at the end. Um, but in teaching social justice, as well as intercultural citizenship, teachers must reflect deeply on their own perceptions, values, and beliefs, as well as on those underlying assumptions fostered through the curriculum and teaching materials. Now, we think this is important um, because we think reflection, obviously we've been repeating that theme, is, is crucial to both ICC and social justice, but also we're, we're sort of thinking as, you know, might, maybe right now you can't implement these wonderful ideas in your classroom. It might be a great time to, to stop and reflect on your own practice. Um, so even having you here with us shows, shows us that you're looking to learn. So um, I just wanna show a few different types of self-assessments that you can use. First, um, just ICC specifically, these two, the Globally Competent Teaching Continuum and the Recon 
uh, yeah, we'll say there, um, in the Recognizing Intercultural Competence Tool. These two are self-reflections. I've used both. Um, the first one's obviously for teachers. The second one can be used for you or your students. Um, and they it help you examine what you're already doing, what you already believe, um, and they can serve as a basis for furthering your own ICC development. Um, and then there's also there are also self-assessments you can take to examine your biases in working toward teaching for social justice. Um, one popular choice is the Harvard Implicit Association Test, uh, which you can see here. It's actually a variety of tests depending on which type of bias you're looking bias you're looking to examine. Um, it's not perfect, but it probably is a good starting place if you're if you're looking to examine your biases. Um, and then finally, we wanted to share with you that if you're choosing resources for your students, there's a great tool for examining text choices, again, by teaching tolerance. Um, there's a long version and a light version. And when looking to include diverse texts in your classroom, this tool is a really good place to start. I know Dory's done a lot of work on this topic, uh, more specifically for world language teaching. Um, and she's currently working more on this as part of her research. So feel free to reach out to her if you have any more questions specifically about text selection. Um, and yeah, I think that's it that we wanted to share with you and we are ready to take some questions if you wanna discuss anything further. Perfect, thank you so much. I know Manuel is actually on the call. I saw her, so shout out to her oh, for being on this. Call. No pressure. Okay, so we did have someone ask, let's say, um, we had someone ask about uh, examples or resources for first graders or year one, if you had any ideas for those little ones. Yeah, so um, this is Dory speaking. Um, I'm going to jump ahead because um, uh, Sarah and Andrea both teach in kind of upper elementary. Um, and this year I'm teaching in grades one, two, and three. Um, so I really love including social justice topics even as early as first grade. Um, and I truly believe when we're talking about first graders, a lot of it really comes down to um, having them examine their, their own culture and their own selves. Um, and in, able, in being able to do that, then making next steps to, um, to including other cultures. Um, but I really do for them, especially where they're at developmentally, um, a lot of them are very um, me focused. Um, I'm sure a lot of my first grade teachers know what I'm talking about. Um, so getting them to talk about themselves and examining their own culture is a good way to do that. Um, if you're looking for a specific, specific example, one thing um, as far as critical cultural awareness I enjoy doing with my first graders, um, I'm sure most of you have a color unit that you do in first grade. Um, and with my first graders, we talk about accessibility um, and discrimination based on ability. So we talk about um, using high contrast colors, as you see in like our questions thing here. Um, so when we teach colors, we're not just saying like, this is blue and this is white, but we're saying which color combinations would be best for people who have um, different disabilities and um, different needs. Um, so that's a way for them to kind of critically look at their own culture and we can look at publications from our own culture through that lens. Um, so that's something I do in, in first grade. Thank you. So we did have someone else. If anyone else has any questions, please use the questions box. So we had someone that said, how do you balance that action goal without it seeming as though you are encouraging slash putting forth your own views and encouraging students to follow? I have some thoughts on this, but I'm going to see if Sarah or Andrea has anything to say first. Oh, Dory, go ahead. I, I have something too, but if you if you already have something brewing, go ahead. Um, well, this is just, I I love this question, um, and it's something I grapple with a lot because I do have my own um, very strong feelings about the, um, social justice themes um, and issues of importance. Um, but this is where what Sarah said before is so important and so needed about um, all of the ICC teaching and all of the social justice teaching really has to start with ourselves. Um, so when I hear a student um, maybe saying a statement that I don't necessarily agree with, um, I need to really take a step back and um, what Sarah was saying too about modeling the kinds of behaviors that we would want our students to exhibit. So I don't want to model and say, no, you're wrong, or I don't agree with that and you shouldn't either. Um, 
I, I have to ask questions and be curious. And um, oftentimes I have to ask my students um, to support their opinion or to support their argument. Um, and if they're able to do that with um, their disagreeing view, I just have to accept that. Like there were some students who did not agree that it was unfair for um, not, no accent marks on names, they said, because we looked at the other side where the state said it's really expensive technology upgrade. And they said, it's not fair to ask all the citizens to pay for something that they don't benefit from. And while I disagree with that, um, I had to see things from their perspective and I had to just um, let it go. <laughs> Andrea, what were your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I, I definitely agree with that. And I think, um, one of the things just to go off of that, I think it's important to also gauge um, where your students are getting their perspectives from. I think that a lot of the times we, um, if we really reflect and think about where they're getting their information and their opinions from, uh, we can then uh, expose them to the resources that will allow them to continue to challenge their thinking. Um, so although we might not, uh, we might not, um, you know, outwardly express that we disagree with them. We can um, be there uh, by um, to support their um, outreach in the resources mm -hmm. that they have um, available to them and they are priv privy to. You know, a lot of the times with this idea of knowledge as a social construct, uh, we, you know, we start to see how it really is so. Um, so being able to see where our students are lacking or where um, they are, um, where they need additional information that they might have not considered yet might be a good starting, a starting point. Yeah, and to go off that, um, I think especially in today's day and age, um, have, helping students and guiding them to selecting resources and examining the, the bias within those resources. Um, so if you went back to that text selection tool that Sarah mentioned, the teaching tolerance text selection tool, it really helps teachers think critically about what they're reading and the bias that's um, present in that. There's no neutral information. Um, so but that's a skill that we also need to teach our students. You know, do you know who wrote that? that um, the article that you're reading, um, do you know, what do you know about the author? What do you know about their beliefs? So teaching our students those skills um, is, is I think a great step and um, partnering with maybe your library media specialist to, to create a lesson, um, I think would be really important. Sarah, did you have anything to add? I guess not. No. no. <laughs> Okay, so we have one other question. Um, someone asked if you could elaborate on the color unit with the choice of high contrast colors for people with disabilities. She wasn't quite sure what you were de describing or referring to. Yeah, yeah so um, one of the recommendations for people with um, low, vis low visibility or, um, or color blindness is to use high contrast colors. Um, because sometimes like we think something aesthetically looks very nice when we're creating a PowerPoint, um, but for people who don't have full vision, they might not be able to access the information simply because they're not able to um, see those contrasting colors um, or differentiate between those contrasting colors. Um, so the, um, there's a lot of information that comes out about ADA compliance. Um, so that's actually where I get a lot of my guidance for in this. And they actually give you a tool where you can check your, you know, PowerPoints, for example, to make sure that you have a recommended amount of contrast within your colors. So that way people with, um, you know, impaired vision or color blindness um, can access your materials. Um, one quick trick that I teach my students is to take their presentation and put it into grayscale. Um, and if you put it into grayscale or black and white, um, if you can't read it or you can't read it very well, then your color contrast isn't enough. Um, so again, we teach colors, but we teach it in context of, is this accessible or is it not accessible? Fabulous, thank you. Anyone have any other last questions? Um, Marissa, Floor, or Wendy, I don't know if any of you have any questions. Nope. Um, someone asked what the name of the unit for, or the name of the unit for the colors was. 
oh, I don't even think I have it. I think I just call it my color unit. <laughs> um, super basic. I should, I should blog about it. Um, I feel like we don't have enough time to really like do it justice right now. Um, but maybe, maybe you'll, I'll actually get back to my blog sometime soon and write a little bit more about it in depth. Perfect. Um, let's see, we have a question of someone who's working on a transportation unit, I guess, with first grade, if you have any recommendations for that. For, for first grade, I think, I think, Dory, you're our go-to. It was first grade? I thought it was. I yeah, it was first grade, grade, sorry. Yep, first grade. Yeah, well, we actually, so we do a transportation unit um, and we do it in fourth grade. Um, and one of the things, I mean, this is a simple fix. I feel like sometimes when we walk away from webinars or PD, we think that like we have to throw everything out and start again. Um, but sometimes it's something really small. So when I was looking at um, what my district expectations were as far as transportation, I noticed that all of the um, vocabulary that we had in regards to transportation were things that were common within our community. So we had things like car and um, bus and train, um, but we didn't have, for example, bicycle, um, because that's not a common form of transportation in our community. It is a common form of um, like a hobby or just enjoyment. Um, we didn't have anything like, for example, um, a motorcycle taxi, um, which is very common in other countries. Um, I don't even think, I'm not even sure we had a metro. Maybe we did have a metro, but there were just like glaring obvious differences. So I think sometimes um, just including those things is a first step. And what I did, um, I did do this, I said, with fourth grade, but I think it would work in first as well, is I just showed my students a video. It happened to be from the Dominican Republic. Um, of a busy street and said, um, you know, what questions do you have about this? And again, they reflected outside of the Spanish classroom. Um, and they, they had all sorts of questions, like why aren't they wearing helmets and where are the stop signs and things? Um, so it allowed me to kind of um, encourage a questioning attitude um, and, and attitudes of curiosity rather than just providing information for them. And we did have a comment of someone yeah. suggesting to talk about how students go to school. So maybe include something like that in mm. your unit. Yeah, absolutely. Because that's very applicable to, uh, yeah, you do have to think about what is applicable to your students and, you know, where, they, where they're at and what they're interested in. And knowing like first graders don't have many choices about their transportation, like they're just told you know, get on the bus or get in the car. <laughs> they don't make those choices. So yeah, I think that's a good idea is to make it applicable to them. Perfect. You can also approach it, um, you can also approach it within, um, from a sustainability lens mm. um, and really think about um, looking at traffic and, you know, in terms of um, things like global warming and um, air pollution and things like that. Um, but again, I think that working, um, alongside with the classroom teacher and the curriculum that is um, relevant to the students at that age mm -hmm. group uh, will really help to uh, structure your lesson and really um, guide you in the direction that you want to go. Yeah, I agree with that. Okay, not seeing any other questions. So I will say thank you to both Dory, Andrea, and Sarah for your great presentation. Um, any final thoughts? Anything before we head out? Um, we do. Um, we'll send this um, out with our materials as well. Um, but if you want to keep in touch, um, you I don't think you can really see it now, but maybe when you watch the webinar again, you can kind of pause it and um, grab our email addresses. But definitely keep in touch. We're happy to talk about any of the things that we discussed today. Um, and these are just some further readings. These are things that helped us prepare our presentation today and where we got some ideas from. Um, and we already recommended some books, but I, um, a lot of these articles are free online as well. Um, so we can send this out as a, a suggested reading list um, to the participants as well. Perfect. Well, thank you again for your great presentation. I hope everyone stays safe and well, and we'll see you at a future webinar. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone.